Welcome to Counter Report this week. I'm Lorna Vergilli. Thank you for joining us. Part two of the ICC is finally completed. Maryland officials opened a new stretch of the inner county connector, extending the toll highway another 10.4 miles into Prince George's County, connecting Interstate 270 and I-95. The ICC links people with opportunities. Uh, and jobs are at the center of these linkages. Uh, creating and sustaining jobs in Maryland has been and will continue to be our highest priority. The construction of the ICC has been a catalyst for job creation, uh, creating nearly 5,000 jobs for men and women who have worked on, these pro on this uh, project. Investing in our infrastructure, uh, in roads and bridges and rail, other mass transit systems, strengthens our state's employment outlook, while at the same time lays the foundation for our long-term economic recovery. The first section of the ICC opened earlier this year and extended from I-270 and I-370 to Georgia Avenue south of Olney. The second section will pick up from Georgia Avenue to I-95. Construction cost has topped $2.6 billion. And motorists will be able to use the road free of charge until December 5th. Our Susan Kennedy took the trip along the new ICC and found out what folks had to say about this new transportation choice. After more than 50 years of waiting, the day has finally arrived. The ICC is open for business just in time for the Thanksgiving holiday. We are going to go out to 270, the story of my life. <laughs> this is my life story right here. Here we go. I'm going to get on the inner county connector. The 14 mile roadway provides an east west connection stretching from I 370 to 95. Until December 5th, drivers can use the ICC toll free. It's designed to alleviate traffic on the county's congested roadways. What this means for mobility in Montgomery County, uh, particularly connecting our science corridor and the Shady Grove area to I 95, uh, that's going to get those people off the beltway. No question about that, and it's going to give that whole area of the county uh, mobility that it's never had before. There were plenty of folks who were out on the road taking advantage of its convenience and free price. I just want to see how how close it would be to like get to my house yeah. uh, since I live in Laurel. So I think this is the last stop. I just want to check it out, and it's free, so why not? After December 5th, the ICC will cost $4 from end to end. Are you willing to pay the price? Yes. Yes. Why? Why will you pay that money? Um, I don't want to sit an hour in traffic on the Beltway. <laughs> will you pay the money? You think it's worth the price? I think so. I just drove it before. Yeah, I, I think so. The highway, which costs billions to construct, is the first all-electronic roadway in the state. There's no stopping to pay a toll. Just roll through the exits on the ICC and the state will charge your easy pass. Yeah, I drive a lot. So, you know, sometimes I could be in West Virginia or sometimes I find myself uh, heading out this way and it's just so much convenient and avoid all of that traffic of 495. I think it's awesome. Despite headaches and roadblocks along the way, officials say the ICC will be a critical link between development in Montgomery and Baltimore counties. We're going north on 95 right now, headed to Baltimore. Somehow we're going to need, oh, look underneath, look at 95. It will also cut the travel time between Montgomery wow. and BWI in half. That brings BWI way closer uh, to Montgomery County residents um, than it ever was before. If you plan to use the inner county connector after the free trial is up and you don't have an easy pass, visit easypassmd.com. I'm Susan Kennedy for County Report This Week. The federal government has said it will provide close to $89 million in BRAC funding for intersection improvements and a new underpass in Bethesda. Four major intersections near the Walter Reed Medical Center will become construction zones and a $40 million underpass will be created beneath Maryland's 355. We're going to need a lot of help in this regard, and our congressional delegation really came through for us. These are all federal dollars, and so it's not something that was easy to get, and Congressman Van Hollen and our senators, Mikulski and Cardin, really worked very hard. And our county came up with a good plan, particularly with respect to our Walter Reed facility and our NIH, and making sure that people have transit access so that we get people out of their cars to the maximum extent possible. And that's a big chunk of what these dollars are about. 
Executive Ike Leggett and other county and state officials launched a county's new initiative on accessible parking. The new program entitled Respect the Space will enable more aggressive enforcement of the laws pertaining to the space reserved for people with disabilities, as well as proper and legal use of parking placards and disabled license plates. We'll be able to check to see if, um, if a, uh, a placard is um, registered to an 80-year-old man and we see a 25-year-old woman jumping out of the car, um, we then will have probable cause to, to uh, investigate that further, and in fact, we will. During the event, Executive Leggett was accompanied by disabled Army veteran Sergeant Ryan Major and Trish Galilee, chairperson of the Commission on People with Disabilities. As the basic shopping season begins, shoppers are reminded not to park illegally in accessible spaces. Wheaton is now home to the state's first bilingual university that offers accelerated dual language programs. Anna G. Mendes University System opened doors of its Capital Region campus in a big celebration with attendance of federal, state, and local officials. This new facility will help develop, educate, and prepare a whole new generation of dual language nurses, teachers, IT network engineers, hotel administrators, business administrators, and many more. The Higher Education Accelerated Dual Language Program is designed for adults that have not yet completed their degrees. Some of them actually are already professionals but have not been able to validate their degrees. This gives everybody an opportunity to finally be able to achieve an accredited uh, degree and to obviously then be able to be more viable in this economy. As Governor Malley always says, and we mean that we are here to support our increasingly diverse, increasingly upwardly mobile middle class, and this fits both of those categories perfectly. All faculty is completely bilingual. Every course is offered 50% in English and 50% in Spanish, and that allows the student not only to get their degree, but also to improve their language across the curriculum. To enroll, students must be at least 23 years old, have a three-year work experience, and hold previous post-secondary experience. For more information, visit the following website. Executive Leggett spent some reading time with students at Longview School in Germantown. Leggett read a story to middle school age students that receive special education. Longview is a special center that serves students in grades K through 12 who have been diagnosed with severe and profound disabilities. When we come back, the police needs your help in identifying dozens of suspects involved in a mass theft at a 7-Eleven. And you will meet two new members of the police force who help detect firearms. I'm Rockville 11's Bridget Breuer here at beautiful Glenview Mansion. We're previewing the Rockville Art League show in December. That's coming up when County Report This Week continues. Welcome back to County Report This Week. I'm Lorna Vergelli. Did you know that Rockville's Glenview Mansion is available for parties and events and also features a popular art gallery on the second floor of this 19th century home? Our Rockville 11's Bridget Breuer finds out more. Bridget? That's right, Glenview Mansion is one of Rockville's hidden gems and it's where Rockville Art League exhibits their show every December. We had the chance to catch up with arts program specialist Julie Farrell to find out more about this very special show. There's a plexiglass top here. When so it comes to art, Julie Farrell likes to get up close and personal. She's preparing for the December Rockville Art League exhibit. It's always a juried show for Rockville Art League. They come in every May and every December, and people flock in December to come to their show because they often buy Christmas presents here or presents for other holidays. It's a big deal. The Glenview Gallery is a unique experience for visitors, but also for the artists. The artists love coming here, number one, because it's not like a regular art gallery. It wasn't built to be an art gallery, so it has a different feeling. The art shows maybe like it would show in somebody's home, so people can actually see what a piece of art looks like hanging over a mantle, mantelpiece. Um, people can actually see what the sunlight does to a piece of art, and they can imagine that in their own homes. Rockville Art League President Lillian Blum is an artist herself and stressed the importance of art in everyday life. 
I think art adds a whole other dimension to your life. I mean, if you go into a house and there's only bare walls, you really feel like there's something missing. Also, people being involved in the arts find a way to express themselves, and it brings a whole other dimension to life. Um, I think that what we have left from cultures in the past is their art. And I think any society that thinks of itself as a great society should be a supporter of the arts. The Rockville Art League December exhibit will be taking place on the second floor of Glenview Mansion. It's a mixed media juried member show happening December 4th through January 3rd. Julie Farrell wants you to stop by. We have excellent name recognition in the area because there are not that many galleries right in Rockville and this is surrounded by such beautiful grounds that it's really in not only just coming to a gallery to experience the art, it's really an entire experience. The grounds are so beautiful and so well maintained that the whole feeling of the place is comforting and, and relaxing. More than 70 teens and young adults simultaneously enter a 7-Eleven store in Silver Spring and conducted a mass theft. Here is Officer Rebecca Inocente with an update on this recent incident. Officer? Thank you, Lorna. That's correct. On November 19th at approximately 11.20 p.m., Silver Spring officers responded to a 7-Eleven convenience store on Tech Road in Silver Spring for the report of a mass theft. Detectives have determined that approximately 78 young adults entered the 7-Eleven at the same time. Some purchased items, some stole items, and some just observed what was going on at the store. The department did release video surveillance from the 7-Eleven to the public and asked for the public's help in identifying these 78 young adults. Since the time of the release, the department has received an overwhelming response from the community and we're beginning to identify all those involved in this incident. Officer, how challenging is it going to be to identify over 70 teens? Well, certainly, Lorna, we are dealing with a large number. But as I said before, we are receiving an overwhelming response from community members who want to help identify these kids. Also, we're working with local schools to identify these kids, and we've already begun to tentatively identify uh, these kids involved in this incident. Once we identify those involved in the incident, we're going to need to talk to them, because as I stated before, some stole items, some actually purchased items, and some just observed. So once we identify these kids, we have to go and talk to them and, and find out exactly what their role was on that night. Thank you, Officer Innocenti, for that update. Now let's meet two new members of the police department, both trying to trace and locate firearms. They are Callie and Leela, two female German Shepherds that are part of a police canine unit. They can recognize the scent of firearm odor and thus detect firearms and expanded shell casings. The police department will use the dogs to assist in criminal investigations involving a weapon-related offense. The Montgomery County Police Department K-9 unit has 20 handlers and 29 dogs. Now, the fact that the last additions were females has nothing to do with gender, but with drive and capacity. When we come back, holiday eating has begun. Keep it healthy. We'll tell you how. And the lights are already on at Brookside's Garden of Lights. Stay tuned. Welcome back to County Report this week. I'm Morna Virgili. Members of the International Baccalaureate Board of Governors visited Montgomery County Public Schools. They talked with students and teachers at two schools in order to see the IB program and the critical thinking skills it requires in operation. Hi. Welcome to College Garden. The Governing Board of Directors for the International Baccalaureate Program, or IB, gathered from around the world and came together in Montgomery County, Maryland, November 18th. The IB course of study is a rigorous educational program based on international standards and focused on creating active learners with a global perspective. When they put in IB programs, schools get better and stronger, teachers get better and stronger, students get better. And so the whole thing, it brings uplift. It's rigorous, it requires critical thinking skills, and it requires work and effort among the staff within the school or the school district. So you're going to make a difference individually. You're going to take it under, under your command and plant some trees. But well, we think that every tree can make a difference. Montgomery County Public Schools has 14 IB programs, 
eight in high schools, five in middle schools, and one primary years program at College Gardens Elementary in Rockville. Superintendent Joshua Starr toured the school with the visiting IB governing board and spoke with the group about how MCPS incorporates the IB program into the school system and why it's valuable to students. In order for kids to be ready for college and careers, they really need to understand how to work with other people. They really need to understand how to analyze information. They need to understand the world. Um, and uh, the IB approach really helps kids do that. So I think it holds great promise for us. The group then visited Rockville High School for lunch and a Latin dance presentation before visiting a high school history class. The principal of the school says the IB diploma program is preparing her students with a global perspective. I sleep lots better at night knowing that my students who are in the diploma program are getting an education that's comparable with students throughout the world. And we're seeing this on their college acceptances. They're being able to compete with kids coming from all the countries of the world because of the training they get in IB. Students in high school begin the IB program in their junior year. For them, IB is an important step in being prepared for life after high school. An international baccalaureate student is one who is diligent and works hard and tries to apply themselves to the most rigorous courses that are available. I find all my classes actually extremely interesting. And it prepares you for college, which then prepares you for a job, which then prepares you for life. MCPS has 14 schools that offer the challenging International Baccalaureate programs to students. The holidays are here, and to help us make healthy choices on what to serve, here is Montgomery College's professor, Sarah Ducey. Oftentimes people ask me about holiday eating and people get excited about things like Thanksgiving and Christmas, New Year's Eve. And I want to start with hydration, which is sort of a funny place to start because people don't really think about that when they're getting ready for a party. And I might suggest to you that you actually offer a glass of water first. And the reason is if you hydrate your guests, they're actually going to be able to make much better decisions around the foods that they have subsequent to that. When you're offering salty and sweet snacks, people get thirstier. And I think we all know about that one experience we've had with a guest who actually drank too much. And wouldn't it be a little unfortunate if the reason they drank too much was because you were offering them salty snacks instead of mildly salty? You want to offer the alcoholic beverages in smaller glasses and you want to make people work for it. You want to make them get up and go for that drink. The big sit-down dinner that you have or the buffet where people are filling their plate and sitting down and enjoying themselves, there are lots of really nice things that people have and that they select. At Thanksgiving, we would have the traditional turkey. People are having things uh, like fish. They're having poultry. They're having roast beef. Uh, or pork. And these are the kinds of things that I think should really be the centerpiece. Have some really special foods that are your centerpiece and surround them with vegetables. There are foods that we all like that we call comfort foods. Those are the starchy and the sweet things. The corn, the rice, the potatoes at our meal. Don't make a pile of mashed potatoes that's enough to feed an army unless you're going to be really good about helping people with taking home leftovers. Leftovers are terrific. Many of these meals that we make in advance, the big banquet, the big buffet meals that we do, are actually delicious reheated later. So tell your guests, oh, you don't have to eat it all now. I have boxes for you to take some foods home. And most of your guests don't do this kind of lavish cooking at home. They're really happy to take home some of those foods. What would I do before I serve dessert? I'll tell you what I do in my own family. After we eat our large Thanksgiving meal, as an example, we go for a walk and we walk all the way around the neighborhood. If somebody's out um, walking around the block, they're actually getting their heart moving, they're breathing, they're not eating for a moment, and they actually feel more clear-headed, and the conversation is actually much better over dessert if you've had this nice walk. Holiday eating ought to be fun, it can be fun, it can be remarkably nutritious. It's a one-shot deal, we don't eat like this every day, and there's some really special treats out there. Happy holidays. A resolution that establishes a food council in Montgomery County has been approved by the council. This year's budget included a grant to create the food council. The group will work to encourage residents to eat locally grown foods, support those in the county who produce food, and encourage residents to grow their own food. There have been very successful food councils in a number of communities. This is not a new government agency. This is a nonprofit group. Um, that uh, mostly emerged out of the environmental community, but it involves the farm community, um, and it will be a broad-based group. They're really just putting it together now. It's a new initiative uh, that will um, hopefully uh, grow and, and improve access to healthy, nutritious eating, work with the school system to improve uh, the quality of menus in schools, all, all the range of issues around food policy and, um, and nutrition. 
A holiday tradition is back. The Garden of Lights at Brookside opened the day after Thanksgiving and runs into January. No doubt a great family outing. Here is more. Our annual Garden of Lights winter walk through holiday light display will begin right after Thanksgiving. If you haven't been here before, let me tell you it's a spectacular event. Visitors will enjoy walking through the gardens with close to a million colorful lights, all shaped in imaginative displays. Everything ranging from giant flowers to animals, an 11 foot giraffe. We even have a mythical sea monster that we call Nessie. At the conservatory, we'll have a miniature train exhibit running through a holiday display of poinsettias, flowering plants, and evergreens. And then also up in the visitor center, there are volunteer musicians performing every night of the show. If you have been to the Garden of Lights before, then you know that this is a wildly popular event. We get on average between 40 and 50,000 visitors each winter. So if you'd like to avoid some long lines and maximize your visit, I've got some tips for you. Tip number one, come early. The gates officially open at 530, so be on time and maybe even a little early, but you didn't hear me say that. And that way you still have a chance to get home and have plenty of time for the kids to do their homework. My second tip is come during the week when the admission price is a little bit lower. Normally, the weekend price is $25 per carload of people, but during the week, the price goes down to $20, and the lines definitely aren't as long. And then finally, my third tip, if you'd like to really save some time, you can enjoy a light dinner here at the Garden of Lights. Our concessionaire will be selling soups, sandwiches, chilies, hot cocoa, coffee, tea, and of course some sweets. So come to the Garden of Lights and enjoy the all that we have to offer. Please check our website for details at www.brooksidegardens.org. When we come back, the fire department is taking job applications. We'll tell you where to apply. And some volunteers were honored by Montgomery Community Media. We'll be right back. Now's the best time to register for Montgomery College's spring semester to make sure you get your first choice of classes. Choose courses from more than 130 majors and programs offered at our campus locations and online. Register today online or at any of our three campuses. And you can also register now for Montgomery College's winter session classes offered January 3rd through the 19th on all three campuses and online. You can register for this session online or at any of our campus locations. MC's video for the It Gets Better project is now featured on the National Organization's website. Produced by MCTV, the video shares personal stories of students, faculty, staff, and administrators and offers encouragement to LGBT students. Welcome back to County Report this week. I'm Lorna Virgili. The Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service is looking for firefighters. The department is currently accepting applications for the position of firefighter rescuer. Interested persons must apply online by December 2nd, 2011. For detailed information about this opportunity, visit MontgomeryCountyMD.gov and click on Careers. Montgomery County, Maryland is an equal opportunity employer committed to workforce diversity. Last week, Montgomery Community Media celebrated its 26th annual Monty Awards, an event honoring volunteer producers in the community. For those of you who don't know, there have been a lot of changes and improvements to Montgomery Community Media and the MCM Studios. Part of those changes were reflected in this year's 26th annual Monty Awards, and giving thanks to volunteers was the theme for the evening. <music> As part of MCM's big change, a new category was added to the Montes this year, the Bruce Adams Award. Bruce Adams is currently the director of Montgomery County's Office of Community Partnerships and believes in using volunteerism to build a stronger community. The first Bruce Adams Award went to volunteer producer Marion Merowitz.
There are many reasons people volunteer, but at MCM, the bigger picture is to create programming relative to the community. It's extremely important. Uh, it, it brings us all together, and uh, it's so much camaraderie among us, and it, it also, um, we see how important this community television station is. I think public access TV is one of the most important things that most communities that have cable television do. It's a chance for people who are really creative, who are better than a lot of professionals in the market, to really show off their skills. Producers at MCM produce an array of shows, from cooking to wrestling. This producer shows off his skills with his show, MCW Rewind. So high without ropes in the wave protecting their fall. There are no mats down there. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's Turner doing here? What's Turner? Interesting. Oh my God! Well, but thank you so much. This, this means a lot. It certainly was an exciting evening. For more information about this year's winners and how you can become a volunteer producer, just visit us at mymcmedia.org. For Montgomery Community Media, I'm John Sullivan. And we're going to wrap up our show this week with the pet of the week. We feature a black and white female cat who actually loves to sit in laps. Here is Kathy Stanhope from the Humane Society. Hi, this is Kathy Stanhope at the Montgomery County Humane Society with your pet of the week. And this is Portugal. I don't really know how she got that name. I don't think she's from Portugal, but she is a black and white domestic short hair. She's about two years old and four months. Actually, she's exactly two years old and four months. We know that because she was given up. Unfortunately, her previous owner could no longer take care of her. And she was very sad when she had to bring Portugal here. But she was very, very hopeful that Portugal would find another home. And we're hopeful about that, too. She is a very sweet cat. She, I'm told she prefers men. However, she was just kind of put in my lap a minute ago, and she seems to be very happy to sit here. She does like to sit in laps. She's looking for a lap to sit in. And she's a good-sized cat, and she's going to keep somebody's lap very warm this winter if you want to adopt her, because she just wants to cuddle up and love you and be loved. And she just really wants a lap to sit in. So come on down and meet Portugal at the Montgomery County Humane Society. And remember, we're going to be doing pet photos with Santa. We're doing it on December 3rd, December 4th, and December 10th. It's at various locations. So find out more information about it at the web at mchumane.org or give us a call at 240-773-5967. Find out about the pet photos and find out more about Portugal. You come down and meet her and you just very well might go home with your new very best friend. And that does it for County Report this week. Join us at this time every week for a look at what's going on inside Montgomery County. I'm Lorna Virgili, and thank you for watching.